American democracy's best years are yet ahead. You've been a leader in the civil rights world for more than 50 years. How did you go from civil rights leader to co-chair of No Labels? And also, what's the relationship between the civil rights, voting rights, history and agenda and what No Labels is doing and, and your role in it? I, I believe that um, our democracy is strongest when it's participatory. I think our democracy is weakest when it becomes exclusionary. So my becoming co-chair of uh, No Labels is not a departure, it's, it's a part of a continuum Got it. Uh, of right. the evolution of working to bring people together to make public policy change, but also to make social change much more inclusive. Right. Democracy is so stifled and we're so divided, but I think there's a, there's a great future for a new kind of democracy, a new creation of democracy, new forms of democracy that we have not seen so far. You give people an opportunity to participate and help them to improve their quality of life, they will make that choice, they will make that commitment. And I think the failure of the two-party system has been to shut people out rather than to include people. How can yes. we combine and collaborate and get together and, and join our energies together so that rather than all these separate silos of all these great organizations doing amazing things, we can really create that movement. Hello, everyone. I'm John Updike. Um, I'm the president of Open Primaries. I I'm joined today uh, by my co-host for today's discussion, uh, Dr. Jesse Fields, who is a founding board member of Open Primaries. Uh, Dr. Fields, for those of you who don't know her, is a attending physician in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, and maintains a primary care general practice uh, at the Mount Sinai uh, faculty practice in Harlem. And as both a writer, uh, an advocate, a candidate for public office, she has been for decades an outspoken advocate um, for political reform, uh, for political independence and black empowerment. So welcome, Dr. Fields. Thank you so much for, you. for being our Thank co-host you. today. Thank you, John. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you. So our guest today, uh, as Russell mentioned, is Dr. Benjamin Chavis. Uh, Dr. Chavis is a, a veteran civil rights leader, uh, an entrepreneur, a businessman, an educator, an author. Um, he's even been on, on multiple hip hop albums. And um, he began his career back in 1963 as a statewide youth coordinator for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr and has been fighting racial injustice and wrongful imprisonment across the country uh, since the early 60s. He's been a bridge builder, both within the black community and in the broader society. And most recently uh, was named as the co-chair of No Labels. And we're eager to talk with him about that. So thank you, Dr. Chavis, for taking time today to speak with the National Open Primaries community. Well, thank you, John. and. Um... Dr. Fields, I'm looking forward to uh, having this discussion with open primaries. Um, I, uh, I believe that um, the extent to which we can get more participation in our democracy, uh, particularly from a bipartisan perspective and not um, exist on the extremes of the political spectrum, but uh, give more empowerment, more voice, more presence, more participation for those in the middle, I think it would better serve our American democracy. And when American democracy is served, I'll just say this uh, parenthetically, John and Dr. Fields, that when American democracy is strengthened, uh, it, helps us, it helps the global situation. We live Absolutely. in a global world, a global economy. Uh, but yet when things uh, don't go so well in the United States, it tends also to have an effect on uh, the rest of the world. So. I'm looking forward. I, I really love the name of your organization, Open Primaries. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, we like it. We like it. Um, a, a, let me kick things off with with kind of a big question, um, Dr. Chavis. So you've you've been a leader in the civil rights world for more than fifty years, and now you're 
co-chairing No Labels, which has both built a bipartisan problem solvers caucus uh, in Congress and is exploring a unity presidential campaign in 2024. So how, what was your journey? How did you get there? How did you go from civil rights leader to co-chair of No Labels? And also, do you see, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's, what's the relationship between the civil rights, voting rights, history and agenda and what No Labels is doing and, and your role in it? Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a very good question. I, uh, my role is um, like the role of many others in No Labels. Uh, is to help uh, promote, help foster, uh, help encourage uh, bipartisanship. No Labels is a national, a nationwide grassroots movement of, uh, I would say, moderate-minded Americans uh, who not only believe in bipartisanship, but who encourage bipartisanship to solve our nation's uh, major problems. Uh, and I believe uh, the connection between no labels and what I've done over the last uh, 60 some years uh, in the civil rights movement is that we are for uh, uh, equality, mm -hmm. uh, we're for justice, we're for fairness. Uh, uh, some people get nervous when you use the term equity. Uh, I, I believe that um, our democracy is strongest when it's participatory. I think our democracy is weakest when it becomes exclusionary, when we start excluding people from democracy, when we try to suppress people's voting rights, when we try to deny uh, our entrance into uh, what it means to be uh, American in the truest sense uh, of full participation as a citizen, uh, as a uh, civic engagement, civic participation. Um, I, I just recall that I was blessed to be brought in, up in a family that allowed me to join the civil rights movement at a very early age. Mm -hmm. I got my NAACP card when I was 12 years old. Wow. By the time I was 14, I was a youth coordinator statewide in my home state of North Carolina for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So my whole evolution, I grew up in the movement. Uh, I, I was a, uh, a chemistry major in college. I but really became a chemist, but went back to school after Dr. King's assassination in 1968, because I felt that some of us have to keep Dr. King's dream alive. And I just want to point out uh, how important bipartisanship has been, John and Dr. Fields. Uh, when Dr. King made his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963 in August in Washington, D.C., it wasn't just a, a, a dream for Black people. It was an American dream. But I would say it wasn't just an American dream. It was a global dream. Mm -hmm. It was a dream that all the people of the world would find what he uh, coined as a beloved community, where we would uh, rid the earth of hatred, rid the world of uh, racism, rid the world of anti-Semitism, right. rid the world of all these things that have tried to divide the oneness of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so I see no labels. And quite frankly, no labels is 12 years old. It just didn't start. And to uh, Nancy Jacobson and others who have worked so hard to build the Problem Solvers Caucus uh, made very uh, positive inroads. We got the infrastructure bill because of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, we got some of the other uh, major legislation through uh, under the uh, Biden administration because of the Problem Solvers Caucus. But going back to 1964, one year after Dr. King made his I Have a Dream speech, we get the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. And that bill was only possible because of bipartisanship. Senator Everett Dirksen, Republican, Senator from Illinois, and President Linda Bain Johnson, Democratic president from right. Texas, of all places, worked together right. to get the civil rights bill. And so I see uh, this trajectory in my own evolution in the civil rights movement. So my becoming co-chair of uh, No Labels is not a departure. It's, it's a part of a continuum. Got it. Uh, right. The evolution of working to bring people together to make public policy change, but also to make social change much more inclusive. Thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. We really uh, appreciate your your history, your your career, and all that you've done. I think what you're saying is is very important. I've been really struck by the courage and independence that you've displayed 
throughout your career in bringing together people of disparate views, even within the Black community. And so I was wondering, what's the response of other civil rights leaders uh, to your now co-chairing No Labels? Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's been very, uh, <laughs> I'm smiling because uh, uh, some of my colleagues, first of all, I'm a Democrat, but I work with Republicans. And obviously, uh, I was proud to join former Senator Joseph Lieberman, uh, who was a Democrat, and former uh, Republican governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. They're the other two national co-chair. And, and I believe that um, uh, this is the uh, effective pathway of a, a better future in America where we work together. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to answer your question, yes, some of my uh, colleagues in the civil rights movement uh, questioned why I would, uh, in fact, some of them say, uh, Ben, uh, uh, what are you doing? You leaving the movement? I said, no, I'm not leaving the movement. I'm still in the movement. And the movement has various uh, applications, uh, uh, various uh, evolutions. And to me, no labels is a part, it's not separate and a part of the civil rights movement. It is a fulfillment of the civil rights movement, where we bring people together across lines of partnership, across lines of race, across lines of ethnicity, across lines of religion. Uh, it, uh, in my view, No Labels is practicing what Dr. King called the beloved community. Thank you very much. Um, I, I read the article, the op-ed in the Hill newspaper you had recently that discussed the No Labels campaign, which we've mentioned for a potential independent unity ticket for 2024. It was a very good op-ed, uh, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, in talking about the uh, diversity of voters around the country, you, to, to quote what one of the uh, things that you said in the article is, to quote, a growing portion of the electorate is open to supporting a moderate, independent, or a bipartisan unity ticket including a particularly marked interest among African-American, Hispanic, Portuguese, East Asian, and South Asian voters. And I was really interested to find out more about the polling research that was among, that was done, done among these various groupings of voters and particularly the, the diversity of, of the interest in yes. an independent ticket. Th thank you, that's a very important question, very timely. And I'm pleased to report, uh, Dr. Fields, that just this past December, no Labels Commission, one of the largest polls uh, ever done. You know, normally the, the Harris poll or the Gallup poll, or one of these polls, they interview maybe two, 3,000 people, and then they get a sample, uh, which is statistically verifiable to come up with the poll results. We interviewed 25,000 people from all 50 states, uh, uh, representing the broad cross-section of all Americans. And the polling data really was very interesting because it showed that most Americans want to see our political leaders work together. They don't want to see our political leaders that uh, uh, to the extreme left or the extreme right, basically uh, engage in what I would call political silo politics, where you, you stay at one place, you refuse to uh, even talk or compromise and nothing gets done. And so most Americans are worried about the debt ceiling. Most Americans are worried about the preservation of social security. Most Americans are worried about uh, uh, getting health uh, care costs down in post uh, uh, COVID pandemic Absolutely. arena. Uh, and so, and, and also most Americans are worried, they wanna make sure the American economy uh, bounces back. You know, this recent thing with the uh, uh, bank in Silicon Valley and then how that triggered another bank. And then all of a sudden it triggers a bank in Switzerland. So all these things are interconnected. And I think what our polling showed, uh, Dr. Fields, were that the majority of Americans want to see uh, more participatory politics in America with less uh, um, partisan, less division. They want to see more unity. So this idea about a unity ticket, and what does that mean? A unity ticket means a Republican and a Democrat. It doesn't mean two Democrats. It doesn't mean two Republicans finding a unity ticket if the two major parties don't uh, uh, are not successful in getting candidates that really arouse uh, the consciousness and the participation of most Americans. I think that 
Uh, one thing I do want to clarify, I'm glad you asked the question, no labels is not a spoiler. Uh, you know, what normally happens with third parties in uh, the United States, they wind up tilting the election one way or another. That's not our intent. And that is why we're working there in all 50 states to uh, establish ballot lines. We're not gonna use the ballot lines unless it's necessary. That's what we call the insurance policy. But one of the things we find out by working in all these states, because the problem in our democracy is just not in Washington, DC. It's also at the state legislative level. It's also at some of these municipal levels and county levels. We need more fully engagement. And so when, when I heard the term open primaries, I said, wow. I like the way that even sounds, opening up the politics, opening up uh, the political arena for more participation. I think the more, the better uh, across lines of race, across lines of ethnicity, across lines of religion, the more we can get people engaged. And I would like to see us have a debate over the issues, not just the debate over the personality of the politician. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let me, let me just follow up on that. Um, Dr. Chavis. So uh, in, in reading and hearing you talk about this emerging strategy for 2024, you're talking and, and you're out there. Uh, my, my colleague, you know, Danny Ortega in Arizona is, is sending me all the press about the no labels party in, in Arizona. You guys are getting ballot lines all over the country, but you've said you're only going to run a third ticket, a unity ticket if the Democrats and Republicans nominate candidates that are not reflective of kind of the, the breadth of America. So how, how do you determine that? How do you, how is no labels gonna decide whether or not the Democrats and Republicans nominate candidates that are in step with the American people? Is that an ideological question? Is it an attitudinal question? Is it a combo of those things? How do you think about that? I think it's a, it's a participatory question. What okay. it means is, what, keep in mind, in order to get a, a ballot line in any of these states, you have to do a lot of grassroots organizing. Right. You have to get a lot of signatures. You have, and those signatures have to be verified, and which is what has happened. So what we're doing at a grassroots level, we're activating a lot of um, new and profound broadening of political uh, organizing uh, at the precinct level, at the county level, at the state level, at the congressional level, which builds into the national level. So keep in mind, we're, we're creating also a voter file. We're not just registering people uh, randomly. We're not just uh, getting people to sign a petition and then we lose sight of who signed the petition. Got it. So, so that voter file, which is, will be an independent voter file, one of the things that came across also in the poll that was just taken, the majority of Americans see themselves as what? Independent. Right. Why? Yeah. Boy, I think that's very interesting. So if the majority of Americans see themselves as independent, that means then the two parties, Democrat and Republican, have a lot of work to do. So to me, um, if, if uh, the leaders of the two-party system ought to see no labels as a catalyst for them to be doing a more, they, in other words, uh, the Democrat and Republican Party uh, should uh, be following no labels strategy of, of doing the grassroots organizing, identifying the voter file, activating voters, not passing legislation to keep people from vote in some states, not making it harder for some people to vote in some other states. You know, I, I think uh, what's at stake in 2024 is the future of American democracy. Yeah. Should I ask the, another question, John? Or you yeah, wanna... yeah, go ahead, Jesse. I, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'll ask this question and, and we're gonna open up to the audience not in, in a short time. So sure. definitely, you know, this is open primaries. We believe in opening up the process. And my question, Dr. Chavis is, do you think that primary reform, especially a nonpartisan open primary system that, that opens voting in primaries to all voters, of course, including independents and all voters, allowing diverse coalitions to be built across party lines and across ideological lines. Do you think that would help the country to get the country to move beyond partisan division in terms of primary reform, allowing people to vote in nonpartisan primaries? I'm, I'm going to give you an uncharacteristic short answer. Yes. 
<laughs> Thank you. I, I do believe that open primaries will enhance and strengthen significantly American democracy across the board. Thank you. Um, I just I wanted to follow up on something um, in in your Hill piece. Just going back to your recent editorial, one of the things you point out that I think a, lo a lot of us we experience it, but we don't talk about it, is how both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party essentially what they sell is fear. They sell fear, and they you know I get, I'm a, I'm an independent. But I get the emails from both parties and they're 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 the same. The Democrats say, if you don't give three dollars today, uh, the fascists are going to take over the country. And the Republicans say, if um, you don't give three dollars today, drag queens are going to be teaching your children. And I'm, I'm wondering, it, are you having discussions within no labels about how. How you can bring together Democrats and Republicans to create something new and go beyond that culture. It, like, I, I feel very troubled by just how much fear is peddled by both political parties for their fundraising purposes. And it, it's year in and year out. It's not just the six weeks before election, it's 12 months a year. And politicians have to live in that culture. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, John. Uh, another very good question. I, I think the politics of fear led to January the 6th. Uh -huh. uh, and I think our nation came too close uh, to uh, uh, where people, because of the politics of fear, then it becomes the politics of violence. Then it becomes the politics of uh, of, of uh, demonizing the other side. And and rather than uh, Americans closing ranks, it further divides. So uh, those of us in no labels, and I'm certain those of you in open primaries, uh, know that um, one of the things that I, that I talk about all the time is, first of all, who are we mm -hmm. as a people? Right. You know, I, I'm looking at all of the faces here on the Zoom call. Um, I don't know your names, I see your names, but I see all of you as part of one human family. We're part of one family. And if we are part of one family, we should not be fearful of one another. If we're part of one human family and we have to make political decisions, even sometimes you may disagree, we don't have to be disagreeable. I don't, I don't have to become your enemy because we have a political disagreement. And, and I think that, um, if you look at uh, our nation, which is still relatively young, yep. talking about the United States, we're moving toward a more perfect union. And I'm concerned that there are forces at play now that wants us to move toward a more imperfect union rather than a more perfect union. What I mean by that, inclusiveness, diversity is part of the strength of this nation. It's not part of its weakness. And, and I think that sometimes uh, we have to reassert who we are as Americans, you know, uh, um, and what, what, what has given us uh, the blessings that this nation, and yet that doesn't mean that they're not contradictions. You know, we still have racially motivated police brutality. We still have things that are done. Uh, a lot of communities are entrapped in poverty, uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues. But what, what gives me my encouragement, John and Dr. Fields, is that I've learned something out of the civil rights movement about what happens when people of goodwill come together. You know, we make progress. Right. Absolutely. And if there's any time that we need to make more progress in America, it is now. And uh, and I don't want to I don't want to um, be a witness uh, to our nation uh, retreating or retrenching. I want to be an advocate of of helping to encourage our nation to move forward. And to me, that's why I've agreed to join No Labels. And uh, it, it, quite frankly, it has made some of my uh, colleagues in the Democratic Party a little, they're concerned. But when I explain to them, I'm not trying to hurt them. I don't want you to fear what we're doing. Don't fear No Labels. Don't try to turn us into uh, something that is the antithesis of democracy. 
when we are trying to support the very essence of what it means to be a democracy, where there's equal participation, where there's not only open primaries, but open elections, open democracy, uh, where, where people, yes, uh, there have to be uh, qualifications, and certainly we don't want any voter fraud. It's interesting. All these allegations about voter fraud, no evidence of it. Right. So, so people are being fearful of voting for it, but there's no evidence of it. So where does the fear come from? A lot of misinformation, a lot of stereotypes, a lot of um, uh, trying to point the finger to the other side of the aisle rather than coming together. It was very interesting during the president's uh, State of the Union message, his recent one, uh, when he mentioned that uh, uh, Social Security was off the table. And I was saying, oh, this is big, big, big disruption. But the truth of the matter is, I, I believe both sides I want to preserve Social Security. But, we, but, but in 11 years, it's going to become insolvent if we don't do something. You know, the debt ceiling is coming up this year. And why do we wait right up to the edge before the nation is getting ready to go out to cliff? We scramble to try to get uh, uh, something as a temporary bandage than really fixing fundamentally how we not only pay our debts, but how we create the debt in the first place. To me, we should bring back common sense approaches for our nation's problems. And I, I think there's no problem that cannot be solved in a bipartisan way and working together. And that's what we're trying to do in No Labels. That's great. Thank you. All right, we uh, the questions are um, are are coming in here. Uh, just a reminder: if you want to ask a question of Dr. Chavis, just type your name and state, and then a one sentence description of what you want to ask. Put it in the chat, and then uh, myself uh, or Dr. Fields will call on you, and then you unmute yourself and ask the question. So our first question. Uh, comes from the um, the former Attorney General of Kentucky, Chris Gorman, who has a question about no labels and the forward party. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Gorman. Uh, are you there, Chris? You have to unmute yeah. yourself. There yeah. you go. Right. Uh, my question is uh, uh, the forward party. Uh, how does uh, no labels uh, differ for, uh, from the forward party and does it really, it isn't incumbent on uh, both the forward party and the no labels party to work together. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Chris, um, Attorney General Gorman. Uh, no labels currently is not a third political party. We are a national grassroots movement of moderate minded Americans that believe in bipartisanship. So if you take Kentucky, we believe that Democrats and Republicans and independents in Kentucky can solve the problems of Kentucky to the extent to which they agree to work together. Uh, and we're gonna be, we're actually in Kentucky right now getting signatures for a ballot line. And uh, we will only use the ballot lines in the states where we're getting the ballot lines if it's necessary. Uh, I'm hoping and you know, I'm also a minister. I'm hoping that the uh, Democratic and Republican Party will see uh, the impact, the positive response that No Labels is getting. I hope they see that as a, a challenge and not be afraid of what No Labels is doing, but be encouraged. I, I think that um, uh, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents have to work together in all of our states. So the No Labels, uh, uh, I don't think we've made a decision. Uh, I, I, in fact, we're not going to make a decision about whether or not we're going to exercise what we call the insurance policy until probably next year after Super Tuesday. We'll see how the nominations go, who's going to We've got a long ways to go. You'd be surprised what will happen between now and September or what will happen between now and, and uh, December. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but what I, we do know we need to do some homework. We need to prepare ourselves. And that's why we're getting the signatures now. That's why we're getting the uh, uh, ballot lines now in the states. And the good news is, uh, Mr. Gorman, is that uh, we're getting a very positive response uh, back from uh, ordinary Americans who, who, who actually appreciate that somebody's reaching out to them, uh, not only for their viewpoints, but for their participation. I think um, our, our, our political engagement uh, has become somewhat isolated 
from the mainstream of, of America. And one of the things we're trying to do in No Labels is not only to do this grassroots organizing, but to bring much more of the center back where people in the middle get a chance not only to express their views, but have their views heard and have their views reconciled with the political order of today. Thank you very much. I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go next to uh, Jack Charbonneau in Kansas City, a question about independent voters. Go ahead, Jack. Thank you, John. Uh, it seems to me independent voters are tired of being seen as another voting block that the two parties fight over. In fact, that mindset kind of flies in the face of why so many people have voted or registered as independents. Yes. What's your opinion on an independent candidate running for president in 2024? You've already touched on that a little bit. Yes. Well, I think that um, an independent candidate would have to have an independent apparatus or infrastructure uh, to make that happen. Uh, and I think one of the mistakes that some of the third parties made in the past is uh, not to do the necessary homework, the necessary uh, organizing at the grassroots level so that you can have a great independent candidate, but the candidate doesn't have the wherewithal to compete in the marketplace because of the way uh, state uh, the elections are parsed out state by state. So I think we have to learn a lot of how to translate uh, the independent viewpoints of most Americans into public policies uh, that I'm still hoping. See, I haven't lost faith, uh, Jack, in uh, the two-party system. If anything, I think No Labels is serving as a grassroots challenge uh, to make the two-party system be much more representative much more accountable and much more expressive of the will of the American people. I, I agree with that. I haven't lost faith in the two party system. I just worry that uh, their influences are no longer about the, they're, they're not coming from the voters. It's coming from the, uh, the fundraisers, the, the exactly. people who are actually donors. I think if we can break that, that might be the way to go. I agree. I, I, I really believe that, um, you know, my, my whole history, I just have to tell you, I've been involved in the civil rights movement now for over 60 some years. I'm 75 years old. And one of the things I've learned uh, firsthand in many communities across the United States, you give people an opportunity to participate in helping to improve their quality of life, they will make that choice. They will make that commitment. And I think the failure of the two-party system has been to shut people out rather than to include people. And yep. what No Labels is trying to do is to open up uh, the, uh, the democracy. Uh, you know, um, you know. So I, I guess I'm coming up with a new name. You, you'll call yourselves Open Primaries. I guess I would like to talk about Open Democracy. We like, like that too. I like it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we're going to go next to Greg Blonder. A question about third parties throwing the election to the House. Go ahead, Greg. When, tell Boston. us where you're from, Greg. Where are you from? Uh, from Boston. Boston, okay. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Chavez. Uh, yeah, the question is, as you know, traditionally with third parties, uh, the oh, question is, one is a spoiler. And second of all, if they are a spoiler, there's always a risk that we don't achieve a full majority for one of the candidates and we get thrown to a contingent election, which, as you know, would be an utter disaster. So how do you see navigating those two risks? Well, thank you. You're, you're quite right. I think we should all, all of us, learn from our histories rather than to repeat the histories. And I think one of the problems that third parties have had, it, they have served in some instances as a spoiler, and they have served in some instances because after election, people become so disappointed, then they become further alienated from the political process rather than engaged in the political process. So what we're doing in No Labels, uh, Greg, which is a little different, uh, state by state, we're doing that necessary grassroots organizing. We're doing that necessary building the voter file uh, that will exist beyond the 2024 election. Uh, one of the things we find out, one of the reasons why we live in the age of social media, we live in the age of the internet. Why? Because people feel so isolated. People don't feel connected. 
And, and social media really just connects people. Now, sometimes it connects people for the wrong purpose. But I'm talking now about uh, political engagement, civic engagement, civic participation. And one of the things we're finding out, Greg, at no labels level, is that literally whole communities uh, uh, are, are so thankful, not only if somebody knocks on their door and asks them what their opinions are, but gives them an opportunity to work at the grassroots level. Georgia is a good example. No one ever thought that you would have that kind of voter turnout in Georgia in the last election. And it had high voter turnout because somebody not just went in Atlanta or the major urban areas, they went to every rural county in Georgia and people were just waiting. People told us they had never, no one had never asked them to vote in 40 or 50 years. So I think that our strategy is, is to build a, a, a grassroots alternative that is bipartisan in nature, not partisan in nature. And that if the uh, two major parties uh, uh, nominates great candidates, we don't have to worry. Uh, the best candidate will win. But if the two parties engage in a uh, kind of politics that uh, sort of isolates the majority of the Americans from the decision process, at least we have an alternative. And we've done some homework in terms of the Electoral College. Now, I know that some people, after I wrote that article in The Hill, have said, well, this just proves they're only organizing in states where Biden won. So they're trying to tilt the election to uh, Trump. That's not true. We're not organizing in 23 states, we're organizing in 50 states. And we are hoping that the response would be so tremendous that it will prevent us from being a spoiler, but actually an affirmer of a better future direction for American democracy to the extent to which we can celebrate our coming together as Americans and not be in fear of our constant division as Americans. Uh, there was a, a similar question from Eliza in Washington, D.C. Eliza, did did uh, Dr. Chavis answer your question as well? Or do you, did, did you have something more you wanted to pursue? Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to follow up on that because so far, um, No Labels is only on the ballot in states that Biden won. And so, you know, I, I think and I would I would guess that you likely agree um, as someone who's a Democrat that Trump is an existential threat to our democracy. And if he's likely to be the Republican nominee, aren't you concerned that, you know, given that no labels anticipates that they're more likely to win in states that Biden won compared to states that Trump won, it seems like there could be a good chance that they would throw the election to Donald Trump. Well, uh, thank you, Eliza. I just want to assure you, first, uh, no labels is organizing in all 50 states, not just the states that Biden won. That's number one. Number two, uh, the response we got from the poll wasn't just from Democrats. It was from Democrats, Republicans, and independents who want not a repeat of what happened in January 6th, who want a repeat of not what happened in 2016, uh, but who want our nation to go forward. And, and I think it's a question of getting more people to participate in the election. And, and, I, and I, I believe that the efforts of no labor will enhance voter participation in all of the states. And if uh, after Super Tuesday next year, well, we will make a decision. And I guarantee you, uh, the decision will be made in a way that will not uh, be a spoiler for Trump. That is not our intention at all. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna go to New York City to Jan Wooten, who has a philosophical question about the very term labels. Go ahead, Jan. Great. Oh, Jan, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Dr. Chavis, thank, thank you for entertaining this question. I'm, I'm yeah. just flipping a little bit on the no labels and asking, I mean, the open primaries has done a lot of work on responding to people's sense of outrage at being labeled, being divided, being corralled, the stake driven through to kind of keep us separated. And maybe those labels of left, right, center are no longer uh, uh, no longer useful to us. And maybe yes. we have to come together on some other basis. That's, that's what I wanted us to mull over. Well, that's a good, uh, to me, that's not just a philosophical question. 
But I think you gave the answer in the way you asked the question. Uh, that's why we call ourselves no labels, because we're not uh, interested in uh, what label you may self describe yourself. Uh, we are no labels. We, we, we chose that name. There was a big debate about that name, no labels. And we came, it's just like the problem solvers call, because there was a big debate by the uh, tw um, 28, uh, no, actually it was, uh, yeah, 28 Democrats and 28 Republicans uh, that formed no labels, uh, 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 equal number on both sides, uh, who uh, created the problem solvers caucus. You know, and um, we use, our terminology has to speak to uh, not just uh, independence, but our terminology has to speak to no one being exclusive, no one, no one being excluded. Uh, quite frankly, the way our democracy has evolved, it has become increasingly exclusionary rather than inclusionary. And so we want to make sure that we have much more uh, inclusive participation and that whatever one's prior label may be, uh, that would not be the criteria or the filter to which we try to weed somebody in or weed somebody out. Uh, we think that all of the views of all Americans are worthy of consideration, uh, are worthy of discussion, are worthy of debate. And one word I have not used yet, Janice, in our discussion, that is civility. Uh, we would like to see civility return in our political discourse, where we can even have a disagreement without uh, wanting to uh, do uh, physical harm to you because you physically disagree with me. I, I, I think that we have to, uh, uh, and one of the things we practice and when we meet as low labels, uh, we try to practice what we preach. Uh, we try to uh, utilize the ethos of what it means to work together in a way that uh, for the benefit of all Americans and not for a selected few. Thank you very much, Dr. Chavis. I just wanted to jump in yeah, uh, I thought Jan's question was a, is a great question. I think that the, the the issue of changing, building, transforming, continuing to grow our democracy, and getting rid of the if we can get beyond those labels and divisions, and you know who's on this side, who's on that side. Yes. If we come together and have di real human dialogue and build an environment where we can do that across racial divisions, political divisions, ideological class, all those social divisions. We yes. could create new consensus. People can change their minds and discover new things and have new ideas and grow, but there's no room for that today because democracy is so stifled and we're so divided. But I think there's a, there's a great future for a new kind of democracy, a new creation of democracy, new forms of democracy that we have not seen so far. And I think that's hopeful for this country and, and for the rest of the world, frankly. I agree with you, Dr. Fields, and that, that's what gives me my greatest hope. Uh, I spent a lot of time on uh, college campuses. You can go to some high schools and uh, Generation Z, millennials, they have high aspirations. But something that was said earlier, you know, um, we shouldn't have young people being fearful of the political process. That, that concerns me. Um, you know, it causes a lot of alienation. And I think that um, uh, Americans, American democracy's best years are yet ahead. Yes. Uh, but but we we need to learn from our past, and that's why I'm um, somewhat opposed uh, from a bipartisan perspective of abandoning books, abandoning history. You know, I, I think it benefits everyone to get the truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> You know, uh, and and make sure that our young people know the truth too. I, I think it's a disservice to try to hide truth uh, from our, our youth, or try to hide science, or try to hide that which we know are some real uh, uh, concerns about the future stability of our nation. Uh, and to me, uh, and that's why I'm encouraged. No labels is also intergenerational. There's a whole group of young people now joining. Uh, no labels and getting involved in college campuses and high schools. And I think uh, discussing civics again in class, uh, I think that's healthy. 
I think this discussion about American democracy is very healthy. It's a healthy discussion. Oh yeah. You know, one of the things that that I've found is that there is a a deep, deep interest in exactly what you said, Dr. Chavis, among the American people, left, right, and center, uh, you know, if those terms even matter anymore, on this question of what is our democracy? How are we building it? How are we growing it? But there still is this persistent, um, I don't know, bias from a lot of official political people, you know, in, in, the, in the political industry that say the American people only care about bread and butter issues. They only care about the price of gasoline and, you know, whether their, their streets get, get shoveled if there's snow. And I, I, do, do you experience that? Like that, that, that kind of looking down their noses at the American people? Given that you guys have been out there organizing, what have you found in terms of people's interest in this, in this insurance policy, as you're describing? Well, I think people are very interested. We've got a lot of positive response. But John, I must be honest with you. Uh, some of the biggest obstacles that No Labels has run into has been from the established mainstream media. Right. They, you know, they, they, they. It's hard for them to get their head around uh, people working to promote uh, bipartisanship when the mainstream media uh, is made a lot of money on focusing on the divisions. Yeah. I mean, if you want to get media attention in America today, you do something awful, tragic. You do something. Uh, unthinkable, and you, that's, that'll make the headline. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been talking to CBS uh, radio. I'm thinking about uh, doing a daily segment called The Good News. And so much bad news. I need some good news to be talked about every day. And I think people will gravitate to the good news if we would have the courage to let people know that all is not lost, all is not, you know, uh, 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 unredeemable. I don't think anybody is unredeemable. And I don't think any situation is unsolvable. I, I guess it's just my science background. To me, complex problems deserve complex solutions. And I see that No Labels is helping to uh, try to find, we're not all geniuses, we don't know everything, but we've agreed to work together to try to find uh, the most uh, moderate common sense problems to our nation's greatest uh, challenges today. Well, you know, our next question is all about complex problems. We're going to go to Doug Goodman in Nevada, uh, who has a question about that very that very topic. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Chavis, for, for being here. Uh, my connection, by the way, to No Labels goes back to 2011. And so I, one of their first timed up. But OK, so my question is solving solving problems and getting legislators to collaborate requires actually identifying the problem. And this involves identifying the root cause and solving for that root cause. So I'm just curious, how does the Problem Solvers Caucus incorporate root cause analysis? Thank you, that's a very good question. Well, I, I think um, one of the things we find out with the Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, Doug, is that part of the problem was not the issues. It was the refusal of both sides to work on the issues. And so uh, what the problem solvers caucus did, sometimes at their own great risk, because what happened was because some of the problem solvers caucus voted for the infrastructure bill, some of those people lost their elections. There was retribution. Uh, so one of the things that No Labels does, we raise money for those moderate uh, uh, candidates on both sides of the aisle. Because to me, if somebody's going to put their uh, political career at risk to do the right thing, those elected officials need to be supported and not hung out to dry because they've done the right thing. Uh, secondly, I think identifying the problem, is, as you've uh, said, Doug, uh, um, for example, every time there's a major piece of legislation, they go to OMB to get what is the budget impact, what is, how, what is this piece of legislation, what is the financial impact of passing this legislation. But even after they get the OMB report, it, it, it still pauses off to, well, we don't want to let the Democrats win that. We don't want the Republicans to win that. And so you get to a no-win situation, no matter what the issue is, or know how well the problem is defined, uh, Doug. And that is the major 
intransigence. That's the major obstacle to progress. The refusal is how we define winning. You know, winning right now means somebody has to lose. So why can't we have a, a, a legislation where everybody wins? You know, where the American people win. And, and that's what we're trying to foster in No Labels. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Danny Ortega in Arizona uh, about the No Labels polling. Go ahead, Danny. Yes. Um, you've been uh, talking about this poll uh, that you commissioned uh, from throughout the country. Uh, where can we get access to the results of this poll in the event that we want to use it uh, for the purposes for which you, you organize this whole thing? Uh, I find a lot of things very compelling. Uh, and, and I can't use you as the only reference. I'd like to use the poll if, to refer we, it to. Uh, you can get the poll with us at nolabels.org. Nolabels.org. Thank you. You're quite welcome, Dan. And we got we had a lot of poll respondents from the state of Arizona. And what, what specifically Great. with regard to Arizona, if you can say? Well, uh, one was that... Um, uh, the majority of people polled in Arizona felt that our nation needs to work more on bipartisan solutions to the problems. In other words, Arizonians didn't see themselves just as Democrats or Republicans or independents. They first saw themselves as Americans. And as a result of seeing themselves first as Americans, they wanted to make sure that the public policies that the members of Congress uh, uh, would implement serve their quality of life issues. Uh, you know, and, and I think that's something that all political leaders need to look at, is to make sure that when something is introduced or something is passed or something is debated, that it's just not having a political debate based on whose party is represented, but the debate should be about what's in the best interest of the American people. Thank you. Uh, I wanna to go to Tammy Fillmore in Utah, who has a question about collaboration. Go ahead, Tammy. Hi, it's been wonderful to hear all of this. Um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit in Utah. Uh, we have a C3 arm um, and a C4 arm, much like uh, open primaries and working towards the same goals, education on the one hand, and then advocacy and actually proposing, our plan is to propose a ballot initiative in Utah for top two open primary. What's the um, name of your organization, Tammy? So people for Utah for the number four, and we're just, we've just been building behind the scenes. We're just going public. Right. Um, yeah. So I definitely want to get some contact information, right? And, and talk further with people who are already doing this. And there's, how can we, 2024 is coming up really fast. How can yes. we combine and collaborate and get together and, and, join our energies together so that rather than all these separate silos of all these great organizations doing amazing things, we can really create that movement that's well, so needed. Thank you, Tammy. I think that's an excellent question. And I wanna assure you that uh, No Label staff, uh, we have people also in Utah who would love to work with you collaboratively. Uh, and we would like to also share with you the results of the people that were polled in Utah uh, in December. So if, uh, you know, after this, if you get in touch with uh, nolabels.org, we'd be glad to share that information with you and see how we can collaborate further. Wonderful, thank also, you. Also, just to add my two cents to that question, Tammy, um, one thing is COVID obviously had a huge impact on a whole variety of kind of in-person events. Um, uh, you know, Represent Us used to host a great event called Unrig It, and thousands of people would come and it was a really great, environment builder and that no longer takes place there's there's a growing number of discussions about the need to build contacts where leaders grassroots leaders can come together and learn from each other and build together and collaborate and there's also a national open primaries community that's working on all kinds of schemes initiatives lawsuits legislative campaigns and we will get you plugged into that uh, yes, specific to the open primaries issue but it's it, obviously what you're raising is a much broader issue about collaboration on a whole wide range of reforms and issues. Well, it really is. But to get even more specific, let me jump in since I know we're short on time and say, you know, one thing that we could do is 
share lists. You know, you've identified that important element, Dr. Chavez, of the grassroots and the continued involvement rather than showing up and saying, here's an issue, vote for it this year, and then all that energy on, disappears. Right. And that's absolutely one of our goals is with right. the C3 to create that longevity of that energy and the list building. And so, you know, I'd love for us to talk about collaborating in that way with our lists as well. That'd be great. I think we're on the same page. Great. Thank you. All right. We are, we have time for one more question. I'm going to go to Curtis in Colorado, uh, who has a question about that grassroots organizing and what it looks like in Colorado. Go ahead, Curtis. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being here. This has been great. I just kind of want some specifics on exactly what that grassroots is looking like for you guys um, here in Colorado and just everywhere. Is it, you know, town halls? Is it, um, I don't know. What is it? Well, th thank you, Curtis. Um, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that Colorado is one of the states who made a lot of success. And um, on the national poll, we got so many polling response from Colorado. It was one of the highest responsive states, particularly among millennials and Generation Z in Colorado. Also in Denver and in Boulder, some of the places where there are major universities, uh, we had a, a great response. And I think one of the things that we found in, in Colorado was people want to know not wait to 2024. They want to know what they can do now right. in preparation for uh, 2022, uh, 2024. And part of it is the voter file uh, that was mentioned, but also making these connections uh, in these communities. Uh, one of the things we found out post-COVID was that even in the major cities, a lot of these communities have kind of uh, become isolated. Now they're beginning to uh, uh, reach out and work together beyond your own zip code. <laughs> and, and I think that that's also something that we have to work on. Uh, COVID not only exposed the pre-existing health conditions, but COVID also exposed the, um, the, the, I would call the inadequacy of response at the state level and at the county level to what people's basic needs were. And I think that I, I believe that people want to participate more in that in civic participation because they, what they would like to do, John, is see a situation that we go into 2024, we come out of 2024 much more stronger with a, a participatory American democracy, not weaker. So yes, it is about the presidential race, but it's not about the presidential race alone. It is about the Senate races. It's the congressional races. It is about the down ballot races. All these races are very important. And I think the consciousness of most Americans today is not just who's at the top of the ticket, but who's throughout the ticket that represents their best interests. Thank you, Dr. Chavis. Thank you. Yeah, that's all the time we have. Any last words, Dr. Fields? This has been really very, very inspiring. I think what you were just saying, Dr. Chavis, about it's not just about the presidential, it's also about what communities can build yes. and continue to build and continue to work together on transforming the, you know, the, the conditions and the needs mm -hmm. of our communities, including health, as well as many other, many other things. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's been, been a great conversation. I hope we can have more. I hope so too. And on behalf of No Labels, I uh, want to thank uh, Open uh, Primaries uh, for all of the work that you do. And um, let's continue to uh, have these discussions. Let's continue to collaborate. Let's continue to make a positive di difference and help uh, shape a better future for all Americans and for all the people throughout the world. Well said. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for taking time. Thank you everyone for joining. We have a lot uh, of very exciting conversations planned for the spring and summer. So stay tuned and have a great day.